and and i welcome you to uh, 79th uh, all india ophthalmological conference good afternoon everyone we can uh, now begin our session here i invite dr uh, professor amit gupta professor arun k jain professor uh, amit gupta sorry uh, dr chintan singh malhotra uh, dr rishi mohan dr samar kumar basak um, we can now well, begin our session well yeah. a very good afternoon and uh, at the outset i would like to uh, thank um, all the speakers for agreeing to be a part of this very interesting course on corneal corneal diagnostics and part of the application of the technology and uh, we know that uh, you know in the recent years the technology has changed so much we are i think the nta segment is being flooded with different types of technology uh, how to interpret it how to use it because it involves cataract patients refractive surgery patients dry eye patients so it's very important for every ophthalmologist to be aware of some practical uh, points uh, about how to go about when you see a patient who carries uh, some kind of a report of an eye trace or a pentacam and this is what this uh, course uh, will attempt to focus on and all the speakers of this course are very experienced people they have a lot of um, academic and practical experience in the technologies that they will be talking about and just a brief overview um uh, i'll be talking about the eye trace and professor arun jain will be um, giving some very nice tips about the pentacam dr chintan will be talking about the epithelial mapping and endosigmenosity which has come up so much in the last few years uh dr samar basak of course has a lot of experience with lipid view and lipid flow we look forward to his talk uh, dr rishi mohan uh, is um, i think he has talked all over uh regarding corneal biomechanics he is very experienced and it will be a pleasure uh, to see what pearls he gives for everybody in this course so um this is uh, just an overview of the topics so uh, professor arun jain will talk about the elevation based to uh, tomography with the pentacam axl expanding indications i'll be talking about ray tracing aberrometry for corneal and lens based refractive surgeries Dr. Chintal will talk about corneal epithelial mapping, especially in keratoconus. Uh, we keep wondering what kind of a role does it have in keratoconus? Can we screen patients which are just borderline based on it? And so she'll be answering these questions. Also, a strep, a strep source anterior segment OCT, and it's a re recent thing. It's expensive, but really worth it, I think. Uh, corneal biomechanics, need of the hour, and TFM diagnostics. I think we look forward to this talk, lipid view and lipid flow. So, uh, without uh, further ado, I would like to. invite uh, professor arun jain uh, for his talk on the uh, pentacam professor jain please okay uh, can you see my screen Yeah, is it visible? Yes, it's visible, okay. sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor Amit, for the opportunity, and uh, I think uh, it's going to be an excellent uh, instruction course covering so many diagnostic tools. So, without wasting much time, I'll come to my talk. It's a huge topic, so mainly I'll restrict myself to. Uh, uh mainly to the keratoconus diagnosis and uh, follow up of keratoconus if time permits uh, i will go on to uh, other uh, uh, other indications it's not moving forward okay all right now so i have no uh, interest interest i uh, have financial interest in the subject matter of this talk as you all know there are so many instrument available in the market which uh, gives us tomography but today i'll be emphasizing only on pentacam and uh, these are the various clinical uses of pentacam and i will be emphasizing mainly screening for the refractive surgery and if time permits so we will little bit talk about post refractive surgery r bar calculation as well as the role of uh, uh, pentacam in choosing aspheric and toric iols so coming to the screening for the keratoconus uh, as we know what all things one has to look for in the pentacam is most important is uh, the anterior elevation map and in this map 
values of uh, less than 12 micron are usually considered normal and more than 15 okay. micron in the central 5 millimeter are typically yes janakpuri mein sir c2 oblique 390 hai kaun sa route hai wahan pe aa sakta you can hear me now okay yeah similar number about 5 micron card in the posterior map uh, elevation map are uh, more uh, sort of suggestive of keratoconus and these values are significant only if present in central or paracentral area and in a localized pattern high plus value may be seen in periphery because of astigmatism and do not denote any abnormality this is the right eye uh, elevation front and back elevation of uh, a patient you can see the elevation of 27 micron and 53 micron on the back elevation and these are uh, these are i mean uh, significant and this is the anterior elevation map you can see that uh, corneal thickness is just 418 and the k value is to the tune of almost 50 diopter so these are the advanced cases of uh, keratoconus and this is a uh, uh, elevation is not always in the form of island it could be a tongue shape uh, which is called a peninsula as the keratoconus advances it breaks off from the periphery and uh, it forms into a uh, island so it can arrive from both the side in the form of a bridge pattern and this is the anterior elevation map showing a high k rating as well as very thin cornea in a case of advanced keratoconus but this is a, another case a uh, patient came to us with the minus 2 diopter of uh, refractive error with no cylinder and there was a pachymetry of 560 micron as you can see there is a slight asymmetry of bow tie thickness is okay elevation is uh, to the tune of back elevation slightly on the higher side but within the normal limit so what to do in these cases and uh, this is the right eye of the same patient where there is frank uh, keratoconus as is evident from the k reading posterior elevation anterior posterior and the uh, the thickening so in these cases maybe doing a balin ambrosial enhanced activity looking at this map uh, and looking at comparative activity so this is the uh, reflective map of the same patient uh, showing borderline uh, features of uh, cornea is thin there is a little uh, tongue shaped elevation in the back of the cornea what a uh, Berlin and Bozio map does is uh, <coughs> we it exclude an area of 3.5 millimeter around the apex and it charts a uh, it uh, it calculates a base curve uh, reference base curve excluding yeah, that area. What it does is creating a new reference sphere as a minimal effect on the normal cornea. As you see, the, you know, but it greatly enhances the ectatic area of an irregular cornea as seen in this figure. So looking at the Berlin Ambrosia Ectasia map, it gives you a elevation, a enhanced elevation, which is so important in early cases of keratoconus and which may be masked on the anterior surface by the epithelial thinning. So sensitivity for screening of keratoconus suspect or from fruit keratoconus is increased by looking at this map. So, again, okay, and what all to look for in this daily number is uh, okay. We have to look for these five uh, values of uh, these are again uh, just uh, uh, statistical variation of uh, thickness, uh, back elevation, pachymetric progression, thickness, and a uh, displacement of thickness point and art mass index. But individually, these values are not that important as compared with D value, which is a combination of all these values. So if it is more than 0.2.6 uh, standard deviation, it becomes a diagnostic for keratoconus. So it's a very important map to look for in case of suspect keratoconus. Here you can see it is 11.6 far beyond. This is a word case of keratoconus, but in subtle cases, if it is around two, more than 2.6, it is definitely. And if it is between 1.6 or 2.6, Six, it is said to be uh, one can wait and watch the case, look for the family history, or look carefully in the other eye. And what about the staging? This is the ABC staging. Uh, what, this is a, a one map which is 
tells about uh, the topometric or keratoconus staging. Depending upon all the indices, here you can see the uh, this is a right eye map with the KA, high K rating, asymmetric bow tie, and these is the anterior curvature, posterior curvature, corneal thickness uh, reading in form of a map. And this is a keratoconus grade two, depending upon the severity of the disease. And uh, this is just to highlight this thing, how we can uh, classify the keratoconus based on this ABCD map in the keratoconus. Uh, and in this case, it was grade four, uh, depending uh, because of the anterior posterior curvature and the corneal thickness less than 300. And uh, one can, it is very important to follow up a case of keratoconus suspect. This is a very busy slide. So this is a, a right and left eye of the same patient. And here uh, we can see there is a hardly any progression in the uh, K readings. And if we see the other eye, there is a gradual progression of the uh, disease in terms of keratometry as well as KMAX. And here we planned a C3R. So, uh, so the pentacam is very important for following up the cases of refractive, uh, post refractive surgery or case of keratoconus to see whether the disease is progressing or not. And this is just a, a bar map uh, of same thing uh, shown in a, uh, in, a, in a graphical manner. So I'll skip that. And then coming to the comprehensive pachymetric evaluation strategy uh, map, it, what it tells us is that it defines the rate of change between the central and the peripheral part of the cornea. And this is a normal map. And these two dotted lines uh, tells us the two standard deviation uh, uh, below and above the normal. If it the line falls beyond this, then it has become a sort of a, a diagnostic for like in this case, uh, we have uh, uh, this line falling outside the normal range. So it is abnormal. Anything more than 1.2, uh, this thing is taken as abnormal. Then in holiday report, nothing else is... Uh, but it is just, uh, uh, it shows us best toric fit ellipsoid uh, elevation uh, on tangential curvature. And if you see hotspot posterior elevation as well as uh, thinness precavity at the same point, that becomes diagnostic for keratoconus. And uh, this is a one case of just I'll uh, show this case, then I'll stop because it is uh, too short time to describe all the. Uh, all the features of uh, topo tomography uh, of pentagram in this one small talk. So how to see, this is a case who presented to us with high K rating and the keratoconus uh, indices say, okay, because the K rating is this, I think uh, these are the uh, normal values for final, uh, like D value I've talked about, the elevation at the thinness point, and uh, art max less than 340 is abnormal. So all these points I have discussed. Other indications like uh, calculation of IL power or a uh, role in the toric uh, IL uh, uh, lens selection, I think we can discuss at some other point because of the shortage of time. Uh, Dr. Amit, you take over. Uh, thank you, sir. I, it was a very vast topic and I think you have uh, just ad addressed it in an excellent way. So I think it's very practical tips for everybody. And as uh, Dr. Michael Bellin says, uh, that uh, uh, just like in glaucoma, we just don't look at the disc, we just don't look at the fields, or we just don't look at the IOP. We have to look at all three of them together. And probably with many of these pentacam parameters, it would be a good idea for us to uh, consider uh, all these things uh, together so that we are able to uh, reach a logical uh, conclusion about whether the patient has keratoconus or what we are screening the patient for. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Uh, is my screen visible? Yeah, it is visible. Okay. 
Right. So, yeah. yes, Visible. I mean, yes, right. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So um, uh, I'll be and then moving on to another um, uh, new technology, which is the ray tracing barometry for corneal and lens based refractive surgery. And, uh, you know, I think it's important for us to have the proper concept of a wave front. So just imagine that there's a parallel beam of light. And once it crosses the media, this uh, beam of light bends. Usually it focuses on the retina. And in this case, this beam is not focusing on the retina because uh, so this is the ideal wave front, which is the dashed line, which would make the beam focus. And we have the the dark line, which actually uh, tells us the real wave front and the difference in microns is what we measure and what we call is the wave front uh, aberration or wave front error. This is an example of an irregular wave front. So the uh, beams of light are going crisscross. So of course, the patient is going to have symptoms patient is going to have glare, halos, ghosting, and all other symptoms which can be explained by these kind of aberrations which occur once the light passes through the eye, through the media of the eye. So we have the corneal aberrations and we have the internal aberrations by which we mean the lens and the media of the eye. And overall, then we can study the total corneal aberrations. So these have been mapped into significant higher order aberrations, which are usually of six orders, which are uh, visually significant. So what is aberrometry? Aberrometry is the science of analyzing ocular aberrations. And we have different types of aberrometers. So there are different technologies that they, they work on different principles. So then we have the Hartman check, which have lens lets, and there are fixed spots with the shining. And we have something like a retinoscopy kind of a principle for the skyscopy. Now in normal eyes, they work very well or fairly well but they do have some limitations. They measure all the points at once. So there's a crossover effect when there's some points can cross over and uh, they are highly sensitive to noise. They're slow, require multiple scans, but more importantly, they cannot measure accurately in highly irregular eyes or in highly aberrated eyes. There's a data confusion and it's not physiologic with the real vision. So the eye trace um, uh, is uh, one of the newer modalities. What it does is it sends in infrared laser beams of light, which focus on different parts of the retina. And these are 64 laser beams, and they are um, going, uh, they're uh, shot in four times into the eye. So total of 256 spots are studied. And this is used to generate a very unique point spread function. And what happens is that this is then used to generate data uh, for the eye. So this is, these are the two kind of maps. So we also have the placido based topography of the eye. So we have the auto refractor, which is very accurate. We have a placido topography, we have the ray tracing, we have the pupillometry and we have the auto So uh, it is, it has a lot of qualities. Uh, so when we start analyzing the eye trace maps, one is the data verification. And this is very important that because if, if we get trashed into the machine, it's going to be trashed out. So this means we need to verify that the data we have captured is not getting confounded by some uh, artifacts. Wavefront display is there, so just at a glance. So if we see a smooth green map, it just shows us that the wavefront is very regular in this eye. On the other hand, if we see a multitude of colors, especially bright colors, dark colors, it indicates that this eye probably has significant uh, wavefront aberrations. The Chang analysis gives us ocular aberrations in a very simple uh, format, and it gives us quantifies it. And we can just see, and it color codes it. So we, it's a very easy to spot that, okay, there's something wrong with this eye. For example, we see there are red marks here. The red uh, aberration means they are significant. If they're white, they're not significant. So how does the eye trace help us in planning cataract surgery? Uh, some of these points are valid even for refractive surgery, and I will not be repeating them for that. One, the most important question which comes to our mind is, do I need to operate this patient for cataract or not? For example, this is a 32-year-old female, came for LASIK surgery, has a blue dot cataract. So many times there are different grades of blue dot cataract. And we wonder, um, how can we actually decide whether this patient needs cataract surgery or not? So the ITIS gives us a grading of the cataract, which is based on entirely the, the, uh, the laser beams which are going into the eye and how they are analyzed. So any grade which is more than 2.5, is safe to operate on. It means that the quality of vision after cataract surgery will be significantly better in this patient. So we can see 
uh, these are different grades of of cat fat or opacity grade which we see on the eye trace it also has a vision stimulator so just see this it it is not only a good tool for us to understand what the patient is talking talking about but it's also important tool for us to explain to the patient ki listen i understand what's going on or this is what is going on with your eye and this is something which patients really appreciate when we show them so there's something known as a dysfunctional lens index now this is a term which is coined it quantifies a dysfunctional lens which is due to natural aging changes or there's a diminished optical performance for various reasons which can be a possible source of patient's discomfort in the absence of a cataract and this is calculated in a based on higher order aberrations visual acuity contrast functions mtf so many things are taken into account when we when the dli is given so any dli of less than 5 may be considered for surgery as long as it matches with your clinical acumen what you should do now i'm giving an example of this 52 year old male this patient actually had undergone a ct scan was about to undergo some complicated neurological procedures and he was he came to us as he says i'm having diplopia and i'm not satisfied with my vision advised an eye trace and this is the entire segment of this patient so we can see that this patient had a low dli one and secondly we can see that he has a kind of diplopia on the simulation chart and we could actually explain to the patient don't worry if you get a cataract surgery done you'll be fine another important question is is the patient a good candidate for a multifocal intraocular lens now one of the steps to in, to plan it is angle alpha d and angle kappa now we know that angle kappa is actually the uh, angle of the visual axis to the pupillary center so this is more important for patients who want to undergo refractive surgery and other procedures whereas, whereas angle alpha what it actually means is it tells us how well the intraocular lens is going to center in the bag once we put the iol in so this angle alpha and angle kappa should be less than 0.5 mm this is given in in one corner on the screen in the alpha kappa map so a simple algorithm for iol selection using the eye trace one when a patient comes to us when we are assessing for cataract perform the eye trace and we assess the optical alignment with angle alpha and angle kappa now if the angle kappa is more than 0.5 this patient is a candidate for monofocal iols on the other hand if the camp angle kappa is less than 0.5 then we look at the chang analysis now especially we look at the corneal aberrations so if the corneal aberrations are less than 0.414 or if they are more than 0.14 so if their corneal aberrations are more than 0.14 we should go in for a monofocal lens preferably a spherical iol and that will um, possibly give the best kind of vision to this patient if the corneal aberrations are less than 0.14 then we look at the iol selection screen so one of the screens is also the iol selection screen and then we can go ahead and plan for a toric or a multifocal iol so this is just an example of a patient this is the iol selection analysis it actually even gives the position uh, potential visual complaints matches very well with what patients say in my experience it tells us at a glance are the corneal internal aberrations we take care of when we do the cataract surgery and also it tells us whether this patient is a fit candidate for premium iol as in this case he is also identifying lenticular problems uh, of possible refractive surgery candidates this patient was re referred for refractive surgery and if we look closely just a glance at the dysfunctional lens display shows us that there's something wrong with the lens rather than the cornea and a closer look again at the chang analysis shows us that there is a considerable aberrations which are unexpected and this patient on dilatation had a lenticular coloboma and this is the wavefront map again just a glance at the multicolors uh, of this uh, wavefront map shows us that this is a possibly patient has a lot of aberrations so many times you've wondered if we do if whether to yag a pco is this patient going to improve significantly so these kind of pcos this is the itis map it shows us that the patient is having some visual um, disturbance due to the posterior capsular opacification and we should it should be yag the patient with the tinted iol again we show, we saw considerable coma in this patient he had a scleral fixation iol and we could see that this tilted lens was causing astigmatism better understanding of the patient's vision this has an aperture and we are able to see the wavefront maps 
at distance as well as when he is accommodating. This is my map, Sorry. path near, and when we accommodate, it's a plus one diapters of accommodation. So uh, it's so simple to measure the actual accommodation. It also gives us functions like the point spread function and the trial ratio. Basically, what would a point of light look like on the retina? Okay, and this is quantified on basis of the trial ratio. So it's so easy for us to actually quantify how the patient is, including now the MTF. What is an MTF? It's a measure of the contrast. So we have the image and we have the image on the retina. So actual object to image contrast is measured by using the modulation transfer function. And it's one of the important uni units of visual performance. So this is in a just an example of a patient. We can see this patient was minus two cylinder and we decided to lift up the flap and just zap the patient. And we could see afterwards, after the surgery, the patient has improved considerably. The MTF has improved and the patient was very happy. To conclude, a 2020 unhappy patient is unacceptable in the 21st century. And in this new era of cataract and refractive surgery, it is an invaluable tool, the eye trace, not only in surgical planning, also communicating to the patient, understanding the outcomes of surgery and so many applications of this instrument, I think that we yet have to fully understand. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen and we can uh, proceed uh, to our next talk. Thank you. I'll share my screen now. So, yeah. Uh, so the next talk will be by um, Dr. Chintan and it will be on epithelial mapping. I think this is also a very important uh, new diagnostic tool um, uh, for our patients. Dr. Chintan, please. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Amit, and uh, wonderful to be a part of this course. Uh, I hope my slides are visible. Yes. Okay, so what I'll be talking about uh, in the next few minutes is the role of corneal epithelial mapping, which is a relatively new uh, kid on the block and its role in keratoconus and screening for refractive surgery. Now we know that the corneal epithelium serves multiple functions, but the one which is most recently being recognized is that it also contributes to the refractive power of the cornea. And uh, that's different in different zones and which is why it has led to an increasing interest in the realm of the refractive surgery. And we can see from these recent publications that not only refractive surgery, but also keratoconus and the early diagnosis, it's important. And why is that so? I'll be coming to it in the next few slides. From the practical point of view, epithelial mapping can be done using a very high frequency digital ultrasound or the newer generation of the uh, spectral domain OCTs. Uh, the one we have at our center and I have experiences with the Optopole, which is an extremely fast scan, which uh, scans uh, more than one lakh scans per second and takes a very short time, 0.3 seconds to capture an image. And this is how a map would look like where you have the OCT scan, the pachymetry and the epithelial mapping, which is shown at the bottom. Now, it's under, important to understand that even in a normal eye, the epithelium varies, uh, there's topographic variation. So the epithelium is thickest in the center and it is uh, slightly less uh, thick in the inferior cornea, but it is thinnest superiorly and temporally. And that's because of the effect of the uh, blinking of the lids. Now, this is some data from our population. This was data for around 65 eyes. And we've seen that in our North Indian population, the central epithelial thickness uh, is at the higher end of the spectrum, which has been reported for the, uh, uh, from the rest of the uh, world. Now, the other concept which is important to realize is that the epithelium is extremely sensitive and reactive to the irregularities of the underlying stroma. And this is the concept which is uh, making everybody interested in it. The epithelium tends to mask these imperfections by becoming thicker over the valleys and thinner over the hills. But also important to understand that the epithelium responds to the underlying curvature and also to the rate of change of curvature, but not the stromal thickness per se. So for example, in a case of keratoconus, the, some area is flat because of scarring. The epithelium will thicken over it rather than thinning over it as would normally be seen. A few examples to understand this concept. So this is a 24-year-old female with unilateral keratoconus in the left eye. And we can see that she has an advanced keratoconus with posterior elevation. 
And once we look at the epithelial maps, the right eye, which has no ectasia, has a normal epithelial pattern maintained, whereas the left eye, the epithelium has thinned over the uh, hill, as can be seen by the yellow arrows where the, and the blue areas on the epithelial mapping. So the epithelium thins over the areas where the cornea is steep. At the other end of the spectrum, we have a 20-year-old patient who came for refractive surgery, a small refractive error. And he has a pachymetry, KMAX is around 46 diopters. The pachymetry is less than 450 microns. But we see on the Bell and Ambrosio maps that there is no anterior or posterior elevation. So basically, till now, whatever the technology we've had, we understand that this is a patient with a thin but a regular cornea. And the epithelium reflects that story because there are no hills and no valleys. So the normal pattern of the epithelial and stromal thickness is followed. The top maps show the corneal pachymetry, which is thinnest inferiorly, and the epithelium, which is thinnest superiorly. So what are the clinical applications of epithelial mapping? So uh, it is being increasingly used for diagnosis and screening. So like I mentioned, early detection of form through keratoconus and safer screening for refractive surgery. I'll be coming to this again a little later. If we know how thick the epithelium is, the uh, procedures, the refractive procedures can be refined, whichever are based on the epithelial mapping or the topography, because the epithelium is actually the first topographic layer of the cornea. So for topographic guided LASIK or PRK, or if you want to do PTKs where you don't know whether the epithelium is regular or irregular, and also for customized corneal cross-linking. And in fact, this is one area where I've started recently using it. If we get patients who have thin corneas, I like to look at their epithelial maps, see how thick the epithelium is over the cone, and then decide the future course of action. The third field where it is can be of immense help is in differentiating the trues from the pseudos. So for example, if you have a true ectasia from a pseudo ectasia, in a patient with a contact lens warpage, for example, you would see epithelial thinning, but unlike a keratoconus, underlying that epithelial thinning, the cornea will actually be flat. So just a few examples again. This is a patient who has frank keratoconus in one eye. The other eye is just showing a little bit of irregularity on the anterior topography. But if we see where the white arrow is pointing, the epithelial thinning is showing a, it's just a hint of a, the beginning of an epithelial thinning. And this should get us to get our guard up. Another case scenario which we come across frequently. So this is an 18-year-old female who wants refractive surgery. The refraction is stable. The pachymetry is good in both sides, but we just see a bit of a posterior elevation in the middle, that is the exclusion map, but not on the difference map. And the epithelium, if we see the temporal epithelium in the left eye is a shade thinner than the corresponding area on the other side. So now the dilemma is that in view of adequate pachymetry, refractive stability, a normal D value, are the epithelial findings sufficient to reject this patient? Now, what literature says about this is that although epithelial profiles are valuable in screening for ectatic disorders, they are not sufficiently predictable yet in isolation. And this has been my experience also. The reason for this being that we say that the epithelium follows the curvature. So if in early cases of ectasia, it is the posterior surface which is affected and not the anterior surface. And since the epithelium is following the curvature, usually we will not be able to pick it up in most cases. In some, we would. But where this has a role is that the logistic regression models. So if you are using AI machine learning, this is where it would help us. Uh, we feed the data of different populations into uh, the data and uh, like uh, match it up with other uh, data from the other machines. And that is where it would have a greater role. And this is again our own data from some eyes where we had normal uh, eyes and form frust keratoconus. And we've seen that the central epithelium in form frust eyes is approximately eight to nine micrometers uh, thinner. And the only other quadrant where the epithelium was thinner was the outer inferotemporal quadrant shown in the green. And perhaps these are the areas which one can look at if uh, one is in a little bit of doubt. And this uh, data we've sent for publication, it's under review. And a last interesting case to conclude. So this was a 30 year old female who was diagnosed as keratoconus at an outside center. And she actually came to us for bilateral cross-linking. The center showed some steepening, but it was a 600 micron thick cornea. The, again, the posterior elevate, the anterior elevation was there, but no posterior elevation. And now uh, the epithelium, it's not that we go in this order, but just to demonstrate, I'm just trying to show that the epithelium over the cones was thicker. Whereas if it was a case of ectasia, we would expect it to be thinner. 
And if you look at the uh, cornea, there's irregular heaped up epithelium in the pupillary area. And this was basically a case of pseudokeratoconus due to epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, which the initial ophthalmologist who had examined this patient had missed. So just to uh, show that uh, sometimes when you are confused or you've missed certain findings, which one actually should not be, it can come to your rescue. So to conclude, epithelial mapping is an exciting tool with the potential to further refine corneal and refractive practices. The remodeling of the epithelium is a dynamic process related to various local and environmental factors. The reliability would vary with the health of the ocular surface and tear film, but interpretations must always be made in the context of the clinical findings. Thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing my screen now. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Jinthan. And uh, we can uh, take questions at the end, I think. And uh, you can proceed with the next talk, which is on anterior segment OCT. Okay, yeah, thank you. Just a minute. Give me a minute. I'll just share my screen, sorry. Yes, so are the slides visible? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I'll be talking about swept source OCT, which are the applications for the anterior segment surgeon. Uh, so the AS OCT systems have evolved over time, gone from the time domain, which had a greater penetration and depth of imaging, but a much lower axial resolution. Then we went on to the spectral domain where we had a shorter wavelength used. It had a limited scan depth and a width, but a better axial resolution of close to four to seven microns. For example, the Spectralis by Heidelberg, no financial interest. And then came another OCT, which combines the advantage of both the previous ones so that it uses a swept source laser, but a longer wavelength. For example, the Cassia 2 by Tomy. And this gives us the combination of both a greater scan depth and width, good axial resolution, maybe not as good as the spectral domain, but decent and a very high scan speed, so which makes it very easy to do in children and patients who are a little uncooperative. And just examples of uh, the image on the left showing you a spectral domain OCT where the depth, which can be imaged is two millimeters and the width is six millimeters. On the other hand, the swept source on the right side, where you can see limbus to limbus. So both these images are showing a patient with a phacic uh, 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 IOL, uh, an ICL, where the, we are trying to measure the vault height. But we see on the spectralis, if we want to measure the uh, lens, we have to sacrifice a part of the cornea and we are seeing the angle to angle module. Whereas in the swept source, you can see the ICL, you can see the depth of the lens and you can see the cornea from limbus to limbus. So the swept source OCT allows for a wider and a deeper scan and the entire lens, including the posterior capsule can be visualized. I'll just divide my talk into two uh, little sections, a little bit about the applications of the AS OCT for the corneal surgeon, of course, where the AS OCT, the swept source also is useful, but the others would also do. And the second part where the uh, swept source uh, scores over the uh, other OCTs. So for example, in ocular surface tumors, AS OCT provides us an optical biopsy. These were two male patients in their early 40s with pigmented lesions very close to the limbus. The ASOCT of the image on the top shows us that the basal epithelium and the bowmans are not parallel to each other. So the lesion appears to be arising subepithelially and it seems to be pushing the epithelium up. On uh, histopathology, it came out to be a melanoma and melanomas have been described to be arising subepithelially, not from the epithelium. On the other hand, the picture at the bottom, we have a lesion which seems to be sitting on top of the Bowman's layer. The basal epithelium and the Bowman's layer are parallel to each other. And this was a pigmented OSSN. Not to say that an OCT can completely give us any uh, a histopathological diagnosis is always mandated. And OCTs are most useful only for OSSN. But of course, they do give us a clue as to which layer it is arising from and some clue as to uh, how to go about it further. ASOCT can also be useful in monitoring the resolution of a lesion. For example, another patient of OSSN, we had significant resolution after three cycles of mitomycin C, as can be seen, seen by the yellow arrows, but some hyperreflectivity and abnormal thickness persisted. And so this patient was given topical interferon for an additional two months, after which the epithelium had returned completely to normal. The other is the surgical planning of the corneal pathologies. For example, this is an 11-year-old boy with granular dystrophy. We see that the majority of the lesions are within the anterior 200 microns. So an ALTK was done using a 250 micron head. 
And we can see that on the first post-operative day, a few deeper opacities which were in the periphery can still be seen, but most of the interface is clear. Similarly, this is a 20-year-old girl with advanced keratoconus and some scarring. So you want to know whether the scarring is involving the Desmet's membrane. And the ASOST clearly tells you the picture at the bottom that there was no scarring and uh, uh, you could one could safely go ahead with the DALC. And also, it also gives you the thickness of the cornea at the thinnest point. In this case, a big bubble couldn't be achieved and we did a pre desmetic DALC. And so one, it also helps you to evaluate the interface. Apart from this, the, uh, the list in which the ASOST can be used, the indications are innumerable to determine the depth of PTK, the demarcation line, evaluation of LASIK flaps, and of course, endothelial keratoplasties, which in itself is a separate topic where to see the attachment or the detachment of the graft. So coming to the swept source OCT in particular, what's the added advantage of a swept source OCT? This is a beautiful example. This was a 70-year-old male who was referred with a post-operative non-resolving corneal edema. And one wondered whether it's a hard cataract, excess phaco path. One would think first of a decimus membrane detachment or a pre-op uh, compromised cornea. So I had just uh, sent my fellow there to just, I said, just please go and have a look at the ASOCT and uh, tell me if there's a decimus membrane detachment because that's what I think it is. And she came back and very uh, confidently told me, ma'am, no, I've seen and there is no decimus membrane detachment. So it, uh, the cornea is edematous, but there's no decimus membrane detachment. Now, what happens is I was not convinced, and so I got an SSOCT done. And we can see that the SSOCT, because of its ability to image deeper, picked up the DMD, which was mixed, mixed on the spectral domain because it was further away from the cornea. And we can also see that the center of the DMD is the center of the decimal membrane seems to be missing here. So it's not that the spectral domain, domain OCT did not pick it up, but it picked it up when we asked the patient to look in extreme up gaze, which we can see in the picture at the bottom. Whereas the swept source picked it up in the straight gaze and prevented the missing of uh, this desmet membrane detachment. So post C3 F8 injection, we can see that the cornea has cleared in the periphery where the desmet membrane was there. The central desmet membrane was missing, so the edema is taking a little longer to resolve, and we are just waiting to see whether it will recover it on its own or do we need to intervene surgically. And the other real use where the ASS OCT has come into being is the use for cataracts, be it white cataracts, be it posterior polar cataracts, be it traumatic cataracts. So uh, I'll just go on to some of these images. For example, this was a patient who presented to my clinic. He was a known case of uveitis and he'd received intravitreal steroids around uh, uh, two weeks ago. And the patient reported with a sudden diminution of vision. And we can see how beautifully this OCT is showing in the breach in the posterior capsule. Surgery could hence be planned safely. And we had planned for a three-piece eye well and uh, the eye well could be implanted safely. In white cataracts, there are lots of publications. What most of them emphasize on is that we need to look for the presence or the absence of fluid and also the status of the posterior capsule. For example, this is a young lady who has a swollen cataract. We can see how convex it is, but there are not too many fluid pockets. The small hyperreflective areas initially are the areas of lamellar separation. And in my experience, I would also like to hear the panelists on this. This is a cataract where even if you aspirate the fluid with the needle puncture technique, no fluid will come out. And so this would have a very high risk of an Argentinian flag sign, and I prefer to go in for a femtocataract, femtorexis in these patients. On the other hand, a patient like this with fluid pockets, if we do a needle puncture and aspirate the fluid first before going in for the capsular excess, that would uh, kind of reduce the risk of a runaway capsule. And another kind of white cap tract, you see there's no fluid, the posterior capsule is absolutely intact, and the nucleus is dense, so we can go ahead with surgery. And the last of the, uh, my slides, phacic eyewells, the vault height can be seen with SSOCT as well as the other OCTs, where the SSOCT scores over is that it now gives us some prediction formula for the calculation of the phacic eyewells, although these need to be standardized. But we need to be aware that these prediction formulae are there and these can be uh, used or correlated with our uh, manual markings. The list is unending. And another interesting case of a contact lens fit, the spiral contact lenses can be uh, seen. So to conclude, SSOCT provides a greater depth of penetration and a larger field of view. And if available, it should become a part of the routine workup for white cataracts, traumatic cataracts, and posterior uh, polar cataracts in particular. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Chintan. That was, um, I think, um, uh, amazingly an enlightening talk. It covered, I think, all aspects. Um, I think that you'll have a lot of questions as well. Uh, we will proceed now.
uh, uh, to Dr. Rishi Mohan. We look forward to his talk on Connell bi biomechanics. Thank you, sir, for being uh, uh, agreeing to become a part of this course. And uh, please proceed with the talk. Sir. It's a pleasure, Amit. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Okay, so it's a lovely talks and a beautiful course you've constructed. Uh, you know, covering uh, uh, all the uh, uh, all the aspects of corneal diagnostics. And thank you so much for including me in your course. Uh, can you see my? Uh, can you see the slides? Yes, sir. You can. Okay. So I'm going to talk about something different. So far, we've been talking about uh, imaging techniques, and uh, we've always wondered uh, how imaging techniques, even though they are becoming better and better and more and more sophisticated, are still missing uh, some aspects of, uh, especially in when we're looking at refractive uh, screenings and in the diagnosis of uh, keratoconus. So corneal biomechanics, I feel, and I've always felt for the last uh, almost 12 or 15 years since I got interested in this, that it, uh, it's the corneal biomechanics that probably will provide us with that missing link. But the origins of uh, corneal biomechanics actually goes back more than 50 years to what we call the tonometry studies. And if you, if you remember during residencies, you must have read about the scleral outflow and scleral rigidity. And that's where this concept originally evolved. The biomechanic concepts, uh, there's some disturbance. Biomechanic concepts have gained in importance with the advent of refractive surgery. It is still impossible to measure corneal properties in vivo, uh, possible to better plan refractive procedures that currently still result in unexpected aberrations. And they possess the ability to eliminate the effect of corneal stiffness on intraocular pressure measurements, which is what I will also highlight. So just to basically make people understand what do we really mean when we talk about a viscoelastic system, one looks at the automotive struct assembly. And if you look at this, you will notice that there is one spring or a coil spring area and a viscous element here. So the coil spring is like a regular spring and the amount of deformation that one produces is directly proportional to the applied force. It is independent of the length of time for which that force is applied or the rate at which the force is applied. However, when we talk about the shock absorbing aspect of the shock absorber, it's the viscous resistance or damping that makes a difference where the resistance then to the applied force depends on the speed at which the force is applied, which means when you do it very rapidly, you're likely to get, uh, you're likely to get more damping than you would otherwise. So this is the same kind of philosophy and uh, uh, understanding that makes, us, uh, that makes us understand the corneal biomechanics. So if you look at a Goldman tonometer, it makes static measurements. That is, it keeps increasing the pressure on the cornea till it achieves what we call a static situation of applanation. And it is that steady state applanation that allows us to make the pressure measurement. But the instruments such as the ocular response analyzer and now, of course, the Corvus ST make a dynamic measurement wherein we actually measure the entire movement and monitor that. So if one looks at the air pulse through one of these machines, as the air pulse goes up, there's at one point there is going to be a flattening. And after that, the cornea becomes concave. NCTs lose interest beyond the first applanation point. However, these machines, which now are looking at corneal biomechanics, they look at that first applanation point. They continue to make the cornea concave by increasing the pressure of the air pulse. And then as the air pulse pressure comes down, the concavity of the cornea comes back. And again, it reaches a state of plano or planar state where that is an applanation pressure two, which is the out signal peak. And it is this uh, change in uh, uh, that is then looked at with a great degree of interest by the, uh, by the instrument. So studies have concluded that the variation in corneal thickness affects the accuracy of measured intraocular pressure, but the over or underestimation of the pressure caused by this corneal interference is only valid on average. The relationship is not very significant and it is uh, actually an, an error to uh, just look at the corneal uh, thickness algorithm and try and make the uh, assessments and the corrections of the intraocular pressure based on the CCT algorithm. So if one looks at certain biomechanical uh, aspects such as the hysteresis and we can compare them with the corneal thickness, you can see from the scatter diagram that there is hardly any relationship. The thin corneas can have high hysteresis levels, 
The thick cornea can have low hysteresis levels and it's scattered all over the place with a very, very poor R value. So the relationship between corneal thickness and hysteresis, which is a biomechanical property, is very poor. And this is the problem with CCT-based IOP adjustment algorithms. If one takes a pine wood and one takes an oak wood, the pine wood of two millimeter thickness will bend with a certain force. The oak wood with the same amount of force will not bend. So thickness is not actually resistance. If we look at the, uh, the intraocular pressure, which is compensated for the cornea in normal tension glaucoma and the intraocular pressure from Goldman, one sees that the IOPCC is consistently higher by almost two and a half to three millimeters more than the IOPG. And this is because the IOPCC has compensated for the biomechanical aspect of the normal tension glaucoma. So IOPCC measures higher than current tonometers in NTGIs, and it enables physicians to identify these at-risk patients. Look at this uh, pre and post LASIK IOPCC. Now one knows that we have thinned the cornea. And if you look at the IOPG following LASIK, there'll be an average of a 26% pressure drop as measured, whereas in the IOPCC, that difference is only 3%. So the accuracy of current tonometers is affected by refractive surgery procedures such as LASIK, but IOPCC is much more accurate. So the IOPCC correlates strongly with the Goldman tonometry, but it has the following advantages. It is not affected by CCT. It is not affected by rigidity. It is more accurate in keratoconus, in Fuchs, in ocular hypertension, and in normal tension glaucomas. It has less measured IOP reduction post LASIK, and of course, it has no operator bias. If we examine refractive surgery again, refractive surgeons try to minimize the potential ectasia by leaving a minimum residual bed behind. But this approach is not satisfactory because it's the biomechanical properties that may actually govern the way this cornea will behave. So thickness, like I mentioned earlier, is not strength. And we have a concept of soft corneas, which may require larger residual stromal thickness to be left behind than hard corneas, which may be able to tolerate more aggressive ablation safely than the current guidelines for thickness would allow. So let's look at this uh, scatter diagram again. And once you can see in the red, the average pre-LASIK hysteresis values and the average post-LASIK hysteresis values. And one can see that the post-LASIK hysteresis is slightly lower, but you can see this outlier here. This patient's pre-LASIK hysteresis is lower than the population average post lasik hysteresis. So this is the patient who may become a candidate for ectasia, given everything else to be normal. The other big advantage in, the bio, in these biomechanical devices is that they actually help us classify corneal pathologies. So look at the hysteresis here. Keratoconus, low hysteresis. Fuchs, low hysteresis. Normals, high hysteresis. So one is a thick cornea with low hysteresis. The other is a thin cornea with low hysteresis. So therefore, biomechanical properties are as important as the thickness uh, aspects of the cornea. The corneal signature in these machines is extremely important. And one can see how the in and out signals uh, will behave. This is the normal signal. Uh, the baseline signal is flat, the same amplitude on, on both sides. And if one looks at the uh, signal in the keratoconus, you can see the blunting. You can see there's low CH, low CRF, there's a thin CCT low amplitude pikes, there's a raw signal bounce as well, and more noise. So these noisy signals, of course, uh, are uh, led to less uh, repeatable uh, uh, data. Subclinical keratoconus, again, looks nearly normal, but again has low CH and CRF. Severe keratoconus, you can almost see that there is hardly any signal at all. And this, of course, is no question about the hysteresis here. This is keratoconus. Pre and post LASIK, again, you can see a little bit of a drop in the signal, especially on the, on the outside, and the CH and CRF are low with thin shark and peaks with a reduced signal amplitude and noise. So these ectasia signals, again, are very specific to, uh, to, the, to the biomechanic uh, machine, and one can see the, uh, the keratoconus match index here where the KMI is at 1.05, and this patient has an 89% chance that this is a normal cornea with only a 10% chance that there's a suspicion of keratoconus. Whereas uh, as this KMI level starts to come down, the suspicious index needs, seems to go up and the normal C chances. Uh -huh. 
here again the mild keratoconus and the moderate keratoconus here again you can see that these patients are having uh, data which suggests that there is a, a drop in the biomechanical aspect so here the the normal or the abnormal corneal signatures which have to be seen so to conclude the clinical applications of a biome uh, biomechanical device is that it helps in corneal pathology diagnosis in preoptasia preoptasia screening in post lasik iop measurement in looking at the corneal stability and the wound healing in the diagnosis of glaucoma as well as ocular hypertension and low tension glaucomas and in the efficacy of the treatment monitoring the newer device called the corps the corvis st uses a shine fluke camera but essentially provides us very very similar data as the ora and it can be clubbed with the pentacam to give us new biomechanical as well as uh, uh, optical and biomechanical indices uh, which are called a tomographic biomechanical index and a biomechanical glaucoma factor which again is very similar to what the ora provides so the biomechanics are the need of the r they are a major new investigational modality they are keys in ectasia detection and they are filling the missing link in the screening process they assist proper iop evaluation and the tonometers which are now coming with biomechanically adjusted algorithms are more accurate especially in the diseased corneas and the post refractive cases and these machines are allowing an in vivo measurement of corneal biomechanics that can be used to assess the efficacy of corneal healing so thank you so much i'll uh, stop uh, sharing my screen uh thank you sir that was a wonderful talk i think um, everybody would have really enjoyed it and uh, we move on to uh, the last talk uh, which is by none other than uh, dr samar basar can i have always been very impressed by his uh, clarity of thought his practical tips when to do something and when not to do something he is always very clear in his mind so we are looking forward sir uh, to uh, uh, more uh, tips on the status of lipid view and lipid flow uh, how good are they when we should use them and what is their utility for a uh, ophthalmologist thank you sir thank you omit uh, for your kind words and uh, i'm really honored to be part of your uh, excellent ic so am i visible am i audible uh, yes sir um, you are visible and audible sir okay thank you so i will be talking on lipi view and lipi flow i do not have any financial interest on this so basically if you see the dues to data the overall prevalence of mgd is 38 to 68% over the year of 40 if you see the mgd workshop data uh, there are various uh, population based studies data and they show that the prevalence is between 3.5 to 69% and also Uh, there are uh, various risk factor which may be 80 to 60 percent of the cases. We did our study long time back, and we had seen that the, it is a hospital-based population, and we have seen that the over the age of 30 years, the prevalence is around 31 percent. So, if you see the tear film diagnostic, there are 43 pages document. in the dues to report and anyone can it is a freely open access document so anybody can go through this and there are so many variations so many uh, 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 controversies are there in the diagnostic methodologies so and the investigation there is an algorithm and you see that you have certain questionnaires then you go gradually and you do certain uh, tests then you have to classify as evaporative dry eye or aqueous deficiency dry eye and then you go to your treatment plan so the available treatment for mgd starting from ointment lubricant oral doxycycline or warm compress and massages then external heating packs intense pulse light or ipl then lipi flow system is there memoivian gland expression this is mechanically 
Then for Demodex, we have tree tree oil and omega-3 supplement. So this huge list are the, there and accordingly you go stepwise as per your grading of dry eye and pneumomian gland dysfunction. So now I'm coming to lipid view and lipid flow. Lipid view, currently we are using actually lipid view 2. It is a second generation machine and it has Everything is automatic if it has got different system and actually the technician uh, used to do it and it gives some information about the memomian gland functions. So it has actually three components. One is interferometry and lipid layer thickness and second one is blink dynamics that is called functional component and another one is the structural component that is the infrared myography with some trans illumination devices. So the interferometry actually it is just like if you put oil in water, that kind of effect. And when the machine throws the white light, it shows the color pattern and lipid layer thickness actually calculated from those color patterns. Normal LLT or lipid layer thickness is more than 60 nanometer. So it is basically the whole machine is doing that nothing with us or technician. So if you see this two, two videos given by the MTR science, if you see that the inter ferrometry or interfringe pattern of these two tear film is different in and also it gives actually 20 second measurement and then counts the partial blinks how many of them are partial blinkers how percentage wise and change of lipid layer thickness with each blink and this is also you can show to the patient how your uh, uh, that lipid layer uh, is actually happening. You can uh, videograph it and show to the patient for better understanding. So there are uh, a lipid layer things that some reference values are there. Normally, if it is less than 60 nanometer, if it is less than 60 nanometer, there is 90% specificity for mammalian gland dysfunction. And also partial blink ratio, that is also important. I will show some photographs. And, and that then if it is more than 40% partial blinkers, then you have to train or you have to educate the patients mm -hmm. about the conscious blink. And that is called conscious blink training. And that is the... LLT and tear film dynamics. This is actually the mimography part. Mimography, it is direct. And if you see that it, it, is use, it uses the infrared light and they, uh, it is also for, uh, for the lower lid, there is also the transfer animation system is there. So you have got better contrast. So these are some photographs. If you see that, that the top one is beautifully, uh, the, there is no gland dropout and you see this beautiful glands. And then the, the, it, you can call it normal, then it is mild. If you see that there are certain area of dropout, this is mild dropout, then moderate dropout. Here many glands are missing. Then severe dropout, you can see only the memobian gland just near the memobian duct opening. Whereas the, it also shows us the dilatation of glands. These are the two parameters, dropout area and the gland dilatation. And you see that there is no dilatation in this. In this particular second photograph, you will see there are some dilatation and in the third one, there is moderate dilatation and fourth one is severe dilatation. And if you see there are certain black spots, these are actually blocked gland. So distal part is actually dilated. But the only problem with Lippy View 2 system that machine cannot quantify 
you have to calculate yourself and tell the patient, okay, your half of the gland or your 30% of gland is blocked or 30% black uh, uh, gland dropout areas are there. It is just clinical explanation. It gives beautiful photographs actually in A4 paper. So you can actually show the patient and always keep a normal reference, normal uh, uh, gland uh, structure and uh, uh, that it is there is no dropout and there is no dilatation. And if you show that picture with the patient's picture, they will easily understand what is wrong with their eyes with the memomian glands. <coughs> this is actually, you see that this was done. This is my photograph that both the LLT in the left eye is 53 right eye, which is just borderline. I'm totally 100% partial blinker. And this C factor, C factor is actually how your photography and everything is coefficient factor is normally it should be more than point now. That means you're capturing the photograph is good. So reliability of the test is good if the factor is more than 0.9. So, so I am 100% partial blinker and also my LLT is borderline. So this is important in MGD. So this is the picture. If you see that there are so many glands, there are dropout areas in the upper lid. In the lower lid also, there are dropout areas. And if you see that the, the, the regularity, it is highly tortuous and many of the gland openings, if you see the upper lead margin border along the gray line, you see that there is actually uh, some blocked gland is there. So that is the lipid view system, the lipid flow actually the treatment part it is the combo machine actually lippy view shows you the defect and lippy flow treat it so it is actually gives the thermal and mechanical stimulation at the same time for all four lids the temperature is between 41 to 43 degrees celsius and the masses from the outer lid it is actually giving a pressure of 6 PSI. It is a pulsatile kind of pressure. The cycle is for 12 minutes. The single 12 minute treatment is effective for MGD patients. So it is a 12 minute cycle. Whole procedure takes about 20 minutes to fit and then setting the patient, etc. How does it work? As I told, thermal pulsation, then heat from inner side, and massaging of the lips. So this is the, uh, uh, the activator. You see this device, it is for single use. This is vault, corneal shield to protect the cornea. This is the lead warmer here. And you see the silicon inflation massager. So this is a small video. You see that temperature is raising. So there is a small liquefaction of the memomian secretion. And this goes on like pulsatile manner. And it has a definite cycle of giving this pulsation. So it all does automatic, nothing to do with the technician. Only you have to put uh, a, a topical anesthetic agent and fit the Thing. What literature says? Literature says that it is effective. It is effective. There are few studies available, but long-term studies, only one study is available and say they say that the long-term effect for single thermal pulsation up to three years but it did from this study. But the company people used to say that it will go for one year. So patient might require the same treatment after one year. But when I have taken, I have taken two and a half years back, still now 
it is not recurred, but probably my symptoms has increased recently because of overuse of digital devices in recent last one year. So probably I require second treatment maybe within two, three months. Then there are uh, other like if you come, you can combine with it with oral doxycycline for a three months course, it is better effective. Then also it gives a compliance for the contact lens user. So they are happy if they use it. Then it is also effective post laser vision correction where there are the patients with lichensit and dry eye symptoms. And many patients are happy with this kind of treatment. And other treatment, they also said that, that it is effective both in obstructive and hyposecretory lacrimal gland dysfunction. Also, recent studies, this is in cornea journal, uh, just few months back, and they said that lipid flow only and memomian gland expression manually immediately after DP flow. They compared the two groups and they have shown that, that memomian gland expression after, immediately after DP flow actually better. So after this report, I am actually starting this giving. So ask the patient to come back in the clinic and put a drop of topical anesthesia with your thumb and one uh, butt, ear butt, you just express those glands because the, all the meomian secretion are liquefied at that particular point of time. So the patients are, they have a very good follow-up in this second study and very helpful. So in the clinic, what will you tell? So whom to send for investigation? Evaporative dry eye, but before sending them, you should have all complete uh, uh, dry eye workup, educate the patient about the procedure, explain the prognosis, and from there probably you will get some of the patients who are potential for leafy flow treatment. And uh, tell them about MGD-related study. Whom do you treat? They should understand the goal of therapy willing to modify the lifestyle, this is very important. Affordability issue is there with some of the patients and you only have to tell the patient this, you need repeat treatment after two to three years. So who are the actual potential candidate IT workers? And probably nowadays for last one and a half years, we are doing most because of use of digital devices very much. 12 to 16 hours, refractive surgery patients, and some of the older patients who used to come back to you again and again after beautiful multifocal surgery or beautiful cataract surgery, and you see that nothing is there, that age-related mammogram gland dysfunction is there, so you treat them. They will be happy. Whom not to treat? Absolutely, I showed the photograph, extensive dropout with extensive gland dilatation, probably it will not help. Aqueous deficiency, dry eye with definite sjogren or rheumatoid group of disorders and patient profile and level of understanding is in inadequate. So take home message is lipi view to guide therapy and educate patients. Choose patient counseling, and you have to tell the patient treatment to benefit. There is a lag time of two to three weeks. Patient will like to feel better after two to three weeks. Reduce drop frequency, does not eliminate the need of them. And educate the patient about the blinking, conscious blinking. Recently, too much industry push up for MGD and also a concern. And also the recent concern of COVID-19. So you have to be very careful about handling this kind of patient. Thank you very much for your patience, Yari. Uh, thank you, sir. I think that was a wonderful talk. And we've um, always wondered, um, uh, you know, who to subject to, uh, you know, the lippy flow. It is an expensive treatment. It is uh, costing some money. And um, what is your experience, sir, in patients of neuropathic pain? I, I had a couple of patients. I've not done too much of lippy flow. And uh, now we have recently... No, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. 
Okay, right, sir. Who doesn't I, tell? I, Neuropathy, I treated her at almost five, six patients, but it doesn't tell. It doesn't but, help. But I am telling about the cost. So basically, the cost in our institute is less because we have a clubbing with Johnson & Johnson. So ultimately, I tell uh, Rohi that tomara patient ham le lenge because they with the flight ticket to and fro, our cost will be still less. So if you have that kind of Chandigarh, Kolkata, patient come and treat, go back, the cost will be much less. Because when we club with our lens, because of you know that Johnson is, they are growing in the country. So the machine is almost, so activator they give uh, uh, half of the cost. So that way it is benefiting the patients. So we are charging half or maybe 40% charge of what other people are charging. Uh, uh, Dr. Rishi, any comments, sir? What's the Delhi scenario on this, the Delhi take? I think there's some problem with the Dr. Rishi's connection. Uh, any of the panelists uh, would like to comment, sir? I would like to ask you, uh, uh, Dr. Basak, that when you're doing on eligible patients, still, um, uh, what amount of failure rate do you have? How, uh, how many patients do you find uh, say that, okay, I am not really satisfied with the treatment? So there are patients because you, you see that it is a part of your treatment, MGD treatment part of. Second point is very important, the changing the lifestyle. So you, you are doing lipid flow and next day you are on digital device for 16 hours. So it is it's not possible. So we, we, we educate them that unless you reduce them or you give a gap of one hour, whatever. So there will be actually, uh, you see that then the patient understands. It is not that it is a magic uh, tool, but now I feel that because we are using excessive digital devices recently, so it is like that. Uh, any questions uh, by any of the panelists? I had a question for you actually, uh, Dr. Amit. Uh, so while uh, talking about the eye wells and, and the role of the eye trace and that, uh, you mentioned about angle kappa and al angle alpha in brief. Uh, so what exactly, just for the benefit of the viewers, the role of the angle alpha, because I think angle alpha is also uh, in eye wells very important to see. That's where it tells us where the eye well is centering in the bag. And that's something I think uh, angle alpha is something we should be emphasizing on and uh, looking at in detail. Yeah, so angle alpha D is actually calculated uh, from the limbus to limbus. So basically it calculates how well the intraocular lens would anatomically center in the center of the eye, you know. So that is what is uh, really important in these patients for us to understand that uh, when it comes to a refractive surgery patient, we are bothered many uh, that our centration should be good, you know, for these patients. Uh, whereas uh, when it uh, comes to, into, suppose you put in a multifocal lens and the lens is decentered, then it's not going to be, the patient is not going to be happy because you're, you're disturbing the optics of the eye. Isn't so it? practically speaking, if we see an angle alpha more than 0 0.5, so are we rejecting uh, multifocals just practically? <laughs> uh, practically, you know what? Uh, the thing is, one, the um, number of patients in a normal eye uh, would be very less, actually. Uh, we do uh, do it in many patients, not in all patients. Uh, it might affect the choice of the intro uh, multifocal lens that I'm putting. There are lenses which are less affected by decentration compared to some lenses which are more. Uh, I have used Minivel um, uh, multifocal very well. It has a smooth uh, surface and maybe you can get away with it. There is no hard and fast line on that. But uh, can, uh, I, can I comment on that, Amir? Yeah, I, yes, yeah I, think, I think I agree. Uh, the conventional lenses uh, which are using diffractive principles are probably more susceptible to, uh, to this. But the EDOF variety of lenses uh, you can be a little more uh, generous. Uh, so I have used, uh, I, have a, I have an eye trace and uh, uh, up to 0 0.6 uh, mm of decentration or angle alpha, I have used the mini well specifically, which you mentioned just now successfully. 
but I would be concerned about uh, anyone more than a 0.5, definitely. Strong counseling as well, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Rishi, I just have a question that, you know, now uh, we do, uh, do you do coronal biomechanics in every patient of refractive surgery? 100%. 100%. 100%. All my glaucomas and all my uh, refractive procedures will undergo coronal biomechanics. And in fact, uh, there's uh, today the talk was on uh, corneal diagnostics, but tomorrow's talk is on ectasia uh, specifically. So I have uh, I have some biomechanical cases, in fact, which uh, I have either converted from uh, uh, from Lasix to PRKs, or I have added uh, a C3R to them, or I've just said no. Uh, so with with uh, you know good. Uh, uh, bad displays and good uh, uh, good topographies and tomographies. So uh, uh, I am uh, I believe a lot in biomechanics and that's one of the reasons uh, I started to look at this many many years ago, and it was fascinating actually. Uh, so do you have your own uh, uh, cut off one value of hysteresis and CRF? You say okay fine. This is where I draw the line because this there's a range. Uh, do you look um, at other factors, for example, you know, thickness and other things? Uh, no, yeah. I understand. The, the problem again, and I think Chintan mentioned that, was that you cannot use one parameter uh, right. unless it is way off target. You know, like I have a patient who's, uh, I think it was 7.1, uh, his CH value. And I just took one look at it and I put him back on the machine and it again came out to 7.4. And I said, no, this patient, we are not going to touch. And this patient had already been approved for LASIK elsewhere. Uh, so uh, those that is a kind of a scary number, but the nines and the tens or the eight point eights are the ones that bother because they are the ones which are borderline. There with the borderline thickness, with the borderline topography, with the borderline K, with a little bit of posterior elevation, then you know you're dealing with uh, someone which is who's going to get into trouble. So yes, you have to use this to fill up the blanks rather than to use one value and say this is going to be the cutoff. Right, absolutely. Uh, I can take a... Yes, sir. Yes, sir, please. Yeah. yeah. Today morning only there was uh, one patient for smile uh, and we repeated the corneal biomechanics two, three times. His corneal thickness was patient wanted to go for air force pile. His number is just 1.5 and 1 hour and 2.5 and a 0.75 cylinder in the other eye. Repeatedly in one eye, the corneal biomechanics came out to be 6.3 to 6.7. And in other eye, it's to the tune of 10. So we told him either you get a, a, topo, a topo biographical index, because we don't have a corvus. I don't have any heart to do while on this patient. So everything else is normal. Just on coronal biomechanical, this thing only in one eye, it's around 6.5. So I refused it. Arun, I think in this specific patient, I would look at his epithelium and his dryness very well. Uh, yeah. Because repeatability in the biomechanics is unfortunately not very good. And if you do them multiple number of times, you will get a range uh, yeah. in which the response will come. It won't be like the fixed number coming up again and again. But a 6 and a 10, I've never seen. Uh, so to me, that uh, suggests that there may be some local issue where the biomechanical device is not actually giving you an accurate number. So it may be worthwhile doing an epithelial map. And we, it, we have called the patient again. Uh, uh, is he a contact days. lens user? That's the other thing. No, he is not a contact lens user. Okay. And, uh, and we, this we have repeated not on the same time, over a period of uh, difference of two, three days. Okay. No, no, that might, it might well be. We've seen uh, easily I number of difference of two. Otherwise, he doesn't want a lazy. Just for going into Air Force fire, fighter pilot, he wants. That is the requirement. I said him, oh, you can have a second opinion. <laughs> right. Uh, so, one question, Chintan, for you, and uh, that is that you said that the epithelial mapping, you were using it to guide your cross-linking. And since there are so many uh, queries and doubts about cross-linking, could you very shortly 
uh, tell how it does that. Uh, so we were just looking at the epithelium over the cone and you have the option of looking at the maximum epithelium and the minimum epithelium. So what I look at is the maximum epithelial thickness because uh, that's what you would have below the epithelium. So you look at the maximum epithelial thickness uh, depending on how thick it is, one could decide whether you want to go in for the contactless associated CXL or a transepithelial CXL, or you want to go in for an epi of CXL because sometimes the epithelium will be very, very thin, but the stroma underneath that would be adequate. So depending on situations from that, it's just something I've recently started looking at. Any other comments uh, from everyone? Uh, I just want to say that uh, everyone's talk is so, so nice and excellent talks especially i like those photographs asoct photographs of chintan corbis that one the white it is thank so you sir nice. very nice so, it looks like a volleyball or ah, a basketball <laughs> it is so excellent documentation thank you very nice they were like uh, it's like a ubm uh, photograph yes. but far better clarity and far better far resolution better. It's, oh, yeah. it's a better. pleasure looking at them, no doubt. Only problem is if the media are opaque, uh, then if the cornea is opaque, it might be very yeah. tough to get any kind still, of detail. Still, the yeah. quality of images is excellent. Oh, yeah. We have this Sorry, kind of for the, uh, right. interruption. I think uh, we need to include this uh, yeah. hall because we need to proceed with our next session. Yes. So it, was, right. it was wonderful to have you people here. Thank you to all the speakers for uh, the amazing talk. Thank, thank, thank you, you everyone. Uh, th thank you, Shivani. Right. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Amit. Thank, thank you, Chitin, Shamar, Arun. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.